all kinds of different directions. You're not surprised. You're not surprised. But on the other hand, if you took that cue ball and you hit it against one of the scattered uh, array of balls, and all of a sudden, and like a projector going backwards, it goes back into the rack, you'd think, that's unusual. <laughs> yeah. The point is, there's either, uh, an, you know, uh, there's going to be, a, you know, a propensity uh, uh, to at least stay in order, and if there's any movement uh, or work done or energy released, there's going to be a propensity for that energetic system always to lose order, always to lose organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to make a long story short, there are three major arguments from entropy. I'm just, I'm just going to give you two by way of example. You can get these right from the book. You can get them from the website, et cetera. What's the first one? Uh, the first one is really clear. There's two kinds of radiation out there in the universe. There's the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is really an undifferentiated, disorganized function. It's just not very spectacular. And it's there. It's the remnant of the Big Bang. And of course, everything kind of gets fused into it. And then there's very highly complex light right, with a complex spectrum. And let's just call that starlight. The majority of that kind of light is, is starlight. And what happens in a universal collapse, everyone, let's suppose we're postulating an infinite number of bounces. What happens in an infinite number of bounces, or what happens in a bounce, is basically that all the starlight from the previous uh, expansion gets folded into the cosmic microwave background radiation. It just simply becomes part of that undifferentiated spectrum. Now, if the universe then had been around for 100 bounces, why you'd expect that the cosmic microwave background radiation should be 100 times larger than starlight. And if it had been around for a million bounces, you'd expect that the CMB radiation would be a million times larger than starlight. And if it had been around for an infinite number of oscillations, you wouldn't have any starlight. What you'd have is CMB radiation alone. The fact is, everyone, the fact is, the CMB radiation is only 100 times larger than our uh, starlight. And that can happen from a single bounce. The upper limit would be 100 bounces. But that's the point. Doesn't look like an infinite bouncer to most physicists right now. There is another one, comes from a cosmologist named Sean Carroll, who basically, you know, there's, there's a guy by the name of Roger Penrose, very famous physicist. Roger Penrose calculated, we, we have a very low entropy universe, and that's a very good thing, because you want a lot of complex energy, complex organized energy, in order to get complexification of life and all the kinds of highly, highly, uh, integrated energetic systems. You want lots of, of, of good complex uh, energy to do that, complex systems to do all that work. Now it so happens that we do have a low entropy universe. But as you can see from the law of entropy, a low entropy universe is really against the odds. A high entropy universe where all the, the, the energy is gone, as it were, right? Uh, so that, that's really in favor, right? We, a high entropy means that uh, uh, most of your good useful energy is gone. It's, it's in a disorganized state. It's getting folded into, into a scattered and, 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 and undifferentiated array. Okay. Now, um, what uh, Roger Penrose did was he just calculated um, you know, what the odds against that uh, low entropy universe occurring were. And it turns out, and I don't have this in a nice little uh, figure, but it's 10, and then in the second exponent raised to the 10, and then, I mean, the first exponent raised to the 10, and then in the second exponent raised to the 123 to 1 against our low entropy universe. Uh, that's a big number. Let me try and explain that to you. That's like a 10, and then in the exponent you have a 1 followed by 123 zeros in the exponent. So if you write it out in ordinal notation, that number, if every zero were 10-point type, would take up a large chunk of the universe. <laughs> That's the odds against it. it you know, honestly, the odds of a monkey 
tapping out Shakespeare in a single try by random tapping of the keys is more probable than the low entropy universe that we have. Well, maybe not, but equivalently. And if you believe that, really, wow. Okay, now what's the point? Every single time you have a bounce, every single time you have a bounce, it's going to increase entropy. So you're going to have a tremendous increase in entropy. Right? Roger Penrose makes huge estimates of what that entropy increase is going to be. So just imagine going back in time. Already our universe is 10 to the 10 to the 123 to 1 against. I mean, even Roger Penrose comes out in, in, in his 1986 book. He finally says, well, you know, the creator made the special selections of, of, the, of these constants and conditions in order to have this thing occur. But let's just keep going backward in time for just a moment. And as we go backward, that means... It's going to be more fine-tuned that previous bounce and more fine-tuned the next previous bounce and more fine-tuned still. And in other words, it's getting more improbable and more, like more improbable than 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1 against. So as you're going backward in time, it doesn't seem very likely that the universe was doing a lot of bouncing because, as uh, Sean Carroll put it in uh, one of his essays, it would mean that the universe would have to be virtually infinitely fine-tuned for no apparent reason. <laughs> but maybe there was a reason. But the more bounces you postulate, the more fine-tuning, and the more you have to postulate a designer to get the fine-tuning to come out because it can't be explained by pure chance. In other words, at the end of the day, entropy really does take care of the infinite bouncing universe, and it takes care of even the new theories of infinite bouncing universe that have quantum cosmological and quantum gravitational configurations. Basically, we have entropy still puts a gigantic death knell onto the infinite bouncing hypothesis. But what about the multiverse? And what about maybe an indefinite pre-Big Bang period? There's a whole other set in our triangle, space-time geometry argument. Okay? And the space-time geometry arguments are rather uh, interesting as well. They're, they're very different, but they corroborate the entropy arguments. Uh, I don't want to get into it in a great deal of detail, but what I want to do is just simply say this. One can detect a boundary to space-time by either showing the re requirement for singularity, that is to say a requirement for everything in the past to converge at a single point, prior to which there couldn't have been a physical event, or you can prove it by what we're going to call the BVG theorem, which is a slightly different approach, but comes up with the same boundary to pastime. I just want you to recognize three big space-time geometry arguments. The first one was put together by uh, Borda and Villenkin, Arvind Borda and Alexander Villenkin in 1993. In that particular argument, which, by the way, is still valid today, there is an exception for weak energy conditions, but even Alan Guth said, you know, he's, Alan Guth said, look, the weak energy condition problem is so minimally, minimally probable that I do not consider it a problem. They basically elucidated five conditions in an inflationary model universe, which our universe is, and showed that that inflationary model universe would have to have a singularity. In 1997, they discovered a minimally, 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 minimally probable possibility of weak energy conditions being violated, but it didn't seem like it could apply to any universe even remotely resembling our own. That's still very valid today. I mean, you know, even with the, the possible exception of the weak energy conditions. The second came in 1999. Alan Guth, who is the father of inflationary theory, big MIT professor, uh, he actually uh, showed, after a comprehensive study, goes through, right, assesses every single model. He comes out with this quote at the end. Hard as physicists have tried to find some kind of an inflationary model universe that does not have a beginning, still, he says, the universe uh, right now, every single cosmological model we have built based on an inflationary hypothesis has to have a beginning. He says it's so omnipresent that he considers it a virtual requirement of the inflationary model. 
But then the cap comes in 2003, when Borda, Villenkin, and Guth come up with what's called the BVG theorem, right? Borda, Villenkin, and Guth theorem. And that uh, theorem in uh, 2003 basically states that every inflationary model universe, all you have to have, it doesn't matter what kind of universe it is, absolutely independent of the physics of the universe, right? Independent of the physics of the universe. Any inflationary model universe, so that's, or any expanding universe, in fact, it could be expanding at just a very minimal rate. Doesn't really matter. You just have to have an average Hubble expansion greater than zero. And what they predict is that's going to have to have a beginning too. And they did it in a very simple and elegant way. Essentially, you know, if you just analogize it, as Villenkin does, to, you know, a, a spaceship passing by Earth at 100,000 miles per hour. And, of course, the, 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 the galaxies are expanding away from us at 20,000 miles per hour 